Welcome back to Refocus, a 12-part series on the Krigma. I am here with a few other uh, new guests with us. I'd like to introduce Peyton Kirkman. Hello. Good to have you. Paul Flourish. Hello. Seminarian. Um, I'm Father Scott. It's great to have you with us. As, as we've been walking through this Krigma series, we've been talking about the first part of the Krigma, which is the good, amazing news. God created the universe, placed us in it this time because we matter. We're made for relationship with him. It's good. But uh, we have not touched on the other part, and we've been talking about this a little bit. How would you explain the other part we haven't quite touched on yet? Yeah, so I mean, I've been sort of listening in to some of the other uh, the other talks, and they've been all about kind of the grandeur of God and how he's existed forever and uh, the beauty of each and every human being. Um, but yeah, you know, we've sort of not gotten to the part yet that where we talk about the fall, essentially. Yeah, the bad news. The bad news. Yep, and uh, we don't often like to talk about the bad news, uh, but we're going to talk about it today, and we're not going to really shy away from talking about it because as Christians, we actually look at the full truth. We don't avoid the truth. We do it with the Lord. We don't want to do it outside of Him. So today, we're going to go into some darkness, and uh, it's worse than we would care to imagine. And uh, it's going to be kind of hard to hear. We invite you to stay with us. Uh, maybe watch this episode before watching it with your kids, just to screen it. There's going to be some heavy things with it. All right. There's a quote from G.K. Chesterton I'd like to read first, and then we're just going to go straight into some examples that are very easy just to start pointing out. Bad news. It's dark. There's things here that are not meant to be this way. But here's the quote. The doctrine of original sin is the only doctrine empirically validated by thousands of years of human history. The doctrine of original sin is the only doctrine empirically validated by thousands of years of human history. What do you think of when you hear that quote? That there's one thing that we're sure has existed for all of, like, humanity's sake. Yeah. Any, uh, any images come to mind of examples that you, from the past, anything? You mean like examples of how original sin like affects? Yeah, just, you know, we can see it all throughout the thousands of years of human history. You know, we don't have to have anybody prove it to us. There it is. Yeah, like war, <laughs> death. <laughs> yeah, I think the 20th century, sort of World War II, Holocaust. I mean, that's yeah. usually the whipping boy for this example, but yeah. as old as Cain and Abel. Yeah, World War II, the Holocaust, that's the example we always come back to. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't know this. I did a little research, but uh, um, there are currently more than 40 armed active conflicts going on around the world at any moment. So we know a couple of those, like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, there's a map of all these, actually, if you go online. You just Google a, major, a map of the major active conflicts around the world, and you'll see a map. And there's little red dots all around. You can just click on a dot. It'll tell you what the conflict is, tell you how many people died in it. It'll tell me how many people have been displaced, how many people are living underneath like terror. Just the constant thing uh, going on in the world. That's big global, right? Just an example of like things are, that's wrong. Kids are living in that. Yeah. Um, that's off. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's right. Any other examples just flash into your mind? Yeah, I think on a more sort of domestic level, like the family, I mean, like in so many ways, uh, we might be in a wealthier country or we might be better off in some sense in the United States where we don't have immediate war going on, but our own families have their own issues. Every family has their own issues, but you can mm -hmm. see it sort of statistically like divorce rates are high. Um, we might be wealthy, but we still abort our children in mass numbers, things like this. Yeah. I just have a quote here. This is from Pew Research. This is last year. It came out. It says, the U.S. has the highest world's rate of children living in single parent households. It's almost a quarter of U.S. children under 18 live with just a single parent. Um, yeah. It's not good. Divorce rates are up. It's not the way that God intended it for each and every yeah. one of those children. Mm -hmm. Not the way it's yeah. supposed to be. Right. Something's off. Something's right. broken here. That's more local, right? That's our families, right? That's our families. Um, 
getting even more local to even our own experience as individuals, I think we could look inward and say, something's off in me. That's right. And it's, um, I do things I don't want to do. And I've hurt people more than I would care to share. And I've been hurt by people more than I would care to share with anybody else. Yeah. I, the first time I read uh, St. Paul's letter to Romans in <clears throat> chapter 7, uh, he says, I do the very thing I hate. I know, I know what the good is, but I do the very thing I hate. And I mean, how often? In small ways and in big ways. Uh, do I do that? Yeah. Here's another example. If you were to Google an article online called Death by Loneliness, that's a real uplifting sounding article. <laughs> death by loneliness but uh, I encourage you to read it like, again we look into these things because they're true and they're real they're happening it says that economically America is more prosperous than it's ever been we are richer more connected uh, more medical technology but we're in the midst of a crisis like never before in our century uh, Americans have been dying at a higher rate from suicide alcohol-related illnesses, and drug overdoses. Um, the second leading cause of death for American teenagers is suicide. Um, drug overdose is the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. The leading cause. Something's off. What's making people want to turn to things like this? Some sort of something not being fulfilled in the heart, right? Yeah, I, you're, you're saying these things and I'm thinking of Mother Teresa's quotation mm -hmm. from, you know, the United States, they might be decadent in certain ways, but some of the greatest spiritual poverty is there. So a lot of times we'll be like, oh, this war and conflict, it's outside. Mm. But it's closer to home than I think we care to realize. And I think that's why we're approaching a topic like this, because all this is close to home. I think so. What are you thinking, Peyton? I think we've been living in denial. Like what you were saying about how Mother Teresa was like, there's a lot of spiritual poverty in the U.S., but we don't we don't let ourselves see it. We just kind of like turn a blind eye to it. Yeah. Yeah, Pope Benedict, this is another quote from him. It says, uh, he said, sin has become a suppressed subject, not talked about. We explain it away. But everywhere we can see it. We don't talk about it. We explain it away. But we see it everywhere. Um, from that, uh, that one article I just mentioned a few minutes ago, that article says one in five Americans now report that they have no one to talk to when going through difficult times. Isolation. Like the individual, like, isolation. Gosh, even, even, even before quarantine. <laughs> before quarantine. All of that. Um, so we don't want to make you just simply uncomfortable uh, this is about living in the reality, the truth of reality. God meets us in reality. We're going to see in the future that he has an answer to this reality. But in order to appreciate that, we actually have to look the darkness. We have to look at it. And if there's an avoidance of it, his answer doesn't seem very good. It doesn't seem very pertinent to me. The Christian is not afraid of the truth. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why uh, a lot of our people are falling away is because a lot of us don't really have it. We don't really look at it. Yeah. One last sad uh, thing from research, the Pew Research Center is in the last 10 years, um, those who say that they have no religious affiliation, either atheist, agnostic, or I don't belong to a church, uh, has gone from 17% to 26%, one-fourth of Americans. Spiritual poverty. Not an answer to these things. So if you experience the darkness, right, but there's no answer out there, it's just easy to not engage it and then try to like medicate it with drugs, alcohol. Yeah. yeah. And like these aren't these aren't just like statistics. These are our family members. These, these are, are our people. friends. These, these are, are kids are, I went yeah. to grade school with. We can these name these people. Yeah. Right. Like people suffer this, right? Yeah. That's reality. I, I suffered it in college. Like I just I know the experience of being lost, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's look at a different question, <laughs> a leading question. Ooh, okay, Peyton, why don't you answer this one for us, right? Um, can you think of a time, Peyton, uh, when your, your dad had you help him with something, like maybe a project, I don't know, when you were younger or recently, 
And if he did it on his own, it would just be a lot quicker. But he asked you to help him. And why did he ask you? What do you think? Well, this was actually just last week. But uh, my dad taught me to use a power drill. And um, <laughs> okay. that was a funny sight to see, I think. But, like, it was really, it was a good experience sort of, like, having that sort of bond with my dad because it was just me and him outside working on some different things. But I think the reason why is just that he delights in seeing his child do something that they've never done before um, and just sort of desires to teach new new skills and new crafts. So you weren't very good at, like, a power drill beforehand? No. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. So, so you learned it, right? Yeah. So there's like a joy in learning something new. There's probably a joy in your father seeing you learn something new. Mm-hmm. Now I can add that to my repertoire of <laughs> things I know how to do. All this stuff. Great. Uh, Paul, anything to think of? Yeah, this wasn't so recent as last week. Uh, but growing up, my father taught me how to mow. Uh, and yeah, that was just a, uh, a particularly empowering experience because before I had no way of making money or you know of filling my time with things that were productive you know I was a nine-year-old kid and my dad was teaching me how to push this mower uh, and all of a sudden I was mowing grandma's house and the neighbors and it was empowering nobly did you have the experience of like uh, you're little and so your dad's like bigger than you he's like pushing it you're in in the middle, and you're like you're pushing it with him. Yeah, and there's a certain like hills that I just I mean, they look silly now, but I, I couldn't as a nine year old get them over up then. Could make it not without so, him. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was my example too. Uh, we actually have pictures of my brother and I like with the, the fake lawn mowers, and we'd be out there like <laughs> with my dad, probably getting in the way. He had to probably like like okay, go by, so I don't you know. Thank you, Fisher Price. Yeah. <laughs> And then he let us, uh, you know, like hold on. And then I remember when he let us like let, he let go and he let us mow. And all of a sudden we had like, we took over and we knew how to do something. And I remember just how cool that was. But I also remember like five or six years later after it, like it wasn't exciting or cool anymore. It was actually just a drag and I didn't want to do it. Yeah. I remember one time particularly I was mowing the lawn and I was, must have been like 15, 14, 15 and I just did it so quickly that that there was like parts of it that were like not mowed very well. <laughs> Gotta go back and with then, the scissors. And then, I went, <laughs> and then I just got on my bike really quick and went down the street because I just wanted to hang out with my friends. I didn't want to do that. Yeah, right. And my dad was just like, he brought me back and like showed me the spots. I didn't do it well. But there was this influence in me. It's like, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do my own thing. Do you ever do you have that experience that kind of like this... There's this impulse within us, like, I don't want to just be told what to do. I kind of want to just do whatever I want to do. I just want to be my friends. I just want to do whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Any examples in your your life? (laughs) The first thing that pops into my head is, like, doing schoolwork. Because when you're in grade school, it's, like, kind of fun. You're like, oh, I get to color this picture. And then you get to college, and you're like, I don't, I'm just not about this anymore. You know, I've been in school for, like, a million years now and I'm still in school right now even amidst quarantine and I have to sit down and do my homework I have to sit in my chair and I have to do my homework 27 year old man it's like there's probably something and you're just like I don't want to do this I want to be done yeah. I want to do my own like this is this is a thing that I want I don't want to, I want to do my own life I this is embarrassing but I asked Siri today I said will you do my homework just like a lot killing time what'd she say she responds back to me this quote from Aristotle it says you will tell you about great toil will bring great reward. I, like, I hate you, Apple. Just <laughs> throw your phone. <laughs> That's American decadence for you. <laughs> so, uh, so I think we all have that experience like in growing up or maybe it's at work or at school or, or our parents, especially in our own families, of like this pressure to kind of like to be disobedient yeah. away. Right? And in all reality, like my dad was just like teaching me how to do something because he cared and he wanted me to grow and mature. And I got to a point where I did grow mature, then all of a sudden I was just like, I don't want to need you anymore. Yeah. I don't want to need you. And uh, put up my dad through a lot of pain, right? Talking about suffering and sure. and pain and that. I think a, a very good analogy to that in our faith walk is we do that to God, like all the time. There's this pressure to be like disobedient, like, I don't want to need you. Sometimes even when I pray, 
I pray that God would just make things feel okay for me. And I think I'm just praying that I don't have to need him. Yeah. Because I want to be independent. You sense that sort of pressure, right? I feel like probably you can look back on all your lives and like look at, see like what were the times where I just felt like, you know, the, the story of the prodigal son who took his dad's stuff and was just like, I, I want to just take what you've given me and I just want to run and do whatever I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, what, what is that pressure? Like, how would you characterize, like, what is that? Like, the church gives us actually what that is. Temptation. But temptation, we were talking earlier, comes down to three different things. I remember what those three different things were we were talking about? Wasn't it like the world, the flesh, and the devil or something? Way to go, Peyton. <laughs> there you go. Well, that schoolwork paid off. <laughs> uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, those are these, these pressures that come in. And some of them are external, pushing on us to try to get us to like be just our own person, away from God, away from the family. I just don't, I just want to do my own thing. Some of them are more inside, right? So what would the, the world, as a pressure trying to get us to be disobedient away from God, what would that be like? Think of any examples. Well, this, this like kind of false freedom, which you're talking about. Uh, Peyton and I had just met, but we're already best friends because we both went to Benedictine College. I was so excited, I remember as a, as a young kid, to like, get out of my parents' house and go to college. And I remember thinking like, the autonomy, like the freedom to sort of have my own room, my own space, like all this, be apart from this power, you know? Hmm. And so I guess there was a real, like, a, like a, a lust for freedom, you could say, like just excited to write my own stuff. But little did I know, I mean, as you've sort of been saying, like I was sort of exiting what I thought was the eyes of God in a certain way. And so it was immediately attractive. But after a couple of weeks of my being in college, I realized, like, this sucks. I'm really no good at ruling my own life, actually. What comes to mind, Peyton? Sort of that same idea of, like, desiring this freedom. But not even in that, but also just, like, in daily life, desiring this freedom of from whatever it may be, especially, I don't know, I keep going back to schoolwork, but desiring this false freedom from from uh from being chained to like my professor's zoom calls or <laughs> being chained to like reading this book that i'm very disinterested in yeah yeah what are some influences in the world that kind of feed us and tell us gives us that message often of like you're your own person do whatever you want that influence from like the world that comes through headphones comes through screens right yeah. I think that, that, that idea that the church gives us, like the, the temptation of the world, is like there's a culture in the world that just, that is like the stew that we find ourselves in. Like how many parents at home are like so worried about what their kids are watching, what they're hearing. Sure. What's coming in our ears, our eyes, and what's forming us? Because often it's one of these ones that has, that goes against the way of God, and it, and it, and it says basically settle yeah. for pleasure. Right for honor and for power, for whatever you want to do. Sure. Those are the best goods you can search for. You look at, like you stand in line at a, at a store, like you look at the magazines, are any of them showing what the ultimate good is in life? Our ultimate right. goal, like shoot for the stars, shoot for God. No, it's like cut the belly fat, cut the, it's this worldly, yeah. like, this is what you should look like, this is yeah. how you should act. And at the same time, just be free and don't let anyone tell you what to do. It's really weird. Right. <laughs> kind of right? contradicting. Yeah. 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 So that's the worldly influence. Gosh, parents know this so well because they're just constantly combating it. Yeah. The world. That's the first temptation. I think it's super clear, super easy to see, pretty evident. The flesh. What the heck with the word? The flesh. Is that my skin? Right? Some of these words are kind of confusing. The church says... Another source of temptation or pressure away from God is the flesh. What do you think that? What do you think that would be? Yeah, it's, uh, 
it, it is, I mean, I think it's proper to call it the flesh because in some ways it is bodily, right? Like, I just want to eat 10 chocolate chip cookies that Father Pat made in the rectory. Like, that seems absolutely delightful. Hmm. But it's it's a joke if you really think that because seven chocolate chip cookies in, you've realized you've made a big mistake. But what makes those 10 chocolate chip cookies immediately attractive? Hmm. Yeah, yeah my okay. flesh. I think that's good. Keep sense. Something within us, like, we're attracted to what's easy. Mm. Yeah. What's just going to be the most satisfying? I'm in quarantine. Who's going to know I eat 10 cookies? <laughs> Come yeah. on. Like, it's not yeah. bad. It's not, cookies aren't bad in quarantine. You should eat cookies in quarantine. <laughs> but a moderate amount, is what we're saying. What makes me think of uh, is uh, well, it's the seven deadly sins. Like sloth. It's just easier. Just lay around. I don't want to do my homework. Is it sloth or is it sloth? Is it sloth, sloth. Who knows? I've always pronounced it sloth. <laughs> Sloth must be a, it's a theological debate. <laughs> what are some of those other seven deadly sins? Like? Envy, pride. Envy, pride, gluttony. There's your. There's mine. There's your gluttony. Yeah. Oh man, this one. Like I think one of the highest ones is is uh, lust. Of course. Just how easy it can be just to search for like pleasure of like lust, immediate yeah. satisfaction. You gotta be careful in the grocery store. Check it out. Just look yeah. at the bag. I mean. Like, Billboard, everything. I mean, that's yeah. It's really yeah powerful, especially in our particular milieu. So something in us that's kind of just bent back downwards towards the things of the earth, that we just kind of want to like take those as like, oh, this is just what I want. This is what's going to fill me. It's something within us that does it. So the world is one that's like a pressure from outside. There's something in us though. That's that flesh. So the temptations to push us away from the Lord, the world, the flesh. And the devil, here's a quote from Peter Kreeft. It says, uh, he said, it is said, and he's a, he's a philosopher, Catholic philosopher. It is said that there are three sources of evil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But the world and the flesh would be innocent were it not for the devil. The world and the flesh would be innocent were it not for the devil. Yeah, and that's, that's something like really to mourn, I think, because I think... When we really consider what that means, like what we're looking at is like the resurrected Christ. I mean, what is what is what is undefiled flesh look like? Hmm. It's like the resurrected Lord. It's He who the devil could not touch. Yeah. It's interesting. He's saying like it's not, it's not supposed to be this way. Yeah. We're not supposed to be selfish. We're not supposed to hurt each other. We're not supposed to live in a world like where we get pushed away from God, who's the one who created the world. It's not supposed to be this way. There's something underlying it that broke it from the beginning. Yeah. That's, ne- that's, that's next week, huh? <laughs> Should we talk about it right now, real quick? Okay, yeah, of course. Let's just give a little teaser. Um, so, the devil. Right? What do we know of him? He's a liar, a deceiver. Okay, yeah. What if we did like, uh, what is he? A fallen angel. Fallen angel. So someone who created, created by God, not another God or anything like that, right? Lucifer, the light bearer. Yeah. So we, that's, I mean, that's a positive name for him. Lucifer so, is one of the highest angels. Created good. Yeah, create, he was created by God as good. Created good, but then uh, chose against God, like took this choice against him. Yeah. Um, the Book of Wisdom says that the, the devil... Um, it was through the envy of the devil uh, that he fell. Envy. What do you think the devil was envious of? Well, the first thing is probably like God's power. Just sort of being the highest, not even being, because he's not really being, but like the highest of, of all of things. And, uh, yeah, I think classically we'd say he's jealous of what man was being called to become in Christ when he sort of saw how providence would all play out. And angels know that sort of stuff immediately because knowledge is just sort of immediate to them mm-hmm. of the whole, all, of all history. So the devil becomes envious of the way God became man. Not an angel. God didn't become an angel. He became a man. Yeah, that's that's really good. You you guys both like emphasize different points. I've heard that it was said that uh, his envy that led him to fall away from God, fall away from his own goodness, was uh, two directional. 
So one direction pointed towards God. It's like, I, wa- I don't want to depend on you. I want to be you. Yeah. I want to be that. I want to determine my own stuff. I don't want to. And he just saw God and there's something in it that he did. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to serve. Yeah. Right. And then he looked downward. Didn't want to mow the lawn. <sighs> didn't want to mow the lawn. Just mow the lawn. <laughs> didn't want to mow the lawn. <laughs> then he looked downward the other direction towards uh, all these humans, which were like below him. And he saw how much God, like how much they were part of God's plan. God was going to become one of them. And he was going to have to serve them in some way. And it just filled him with like disgust. Yeah. Right. And so because of these things, it's, I won't serve. I won't do that. And rejected it. And he lost his goodness. So like beauty and goodness have been stripped. And now it's left an ugly hatred. Yeah. And I just, I just want to underline that one thing that you just said. I won't serve. That's sort of the attitude. It's like, is Jesus Lord? Hmm. Or isn't he? Because if he is, that orients your life in a particular way, which is towards genuine freedom. But if it's not, it's to devilish freedom. Yeah. To make yourself king. Yeah, which might seem like a good thing at the time, but uh, we'll see next time coming back that uh, uh, the devil, filled with hatred now, so the book of Revelation says, now wages war against the holy ones of God. That's us. We're in that war. There's something going on. Again, we're in this world. There's something off and something wrong. Church militant. Right. And we are in the midst of it. And we're going to look at that deeper next time we come in. Uh, it's, it's believed that the devil took a third of the angels with him, who also said, I won't serve. And now there's this sort of like power that they have and influence that they have. When we come back next time, we're going to get more into what is that influence? How did this whole thing kick off? Uh, with him influencing humanity. But we invite you to continue to, uh, to tune in with us. And this is a Refocus 12-part series on the Kerygma. God bless.